this morning. Guide us in terms of your word. Open, open your word to us, Lord. Lord, reveal to us what you are saying. May it be your word that transforms us. Lord, thank you that it is living and active. It is not a dead word. Lord, reveal to us your heart this morning in Jesus' name. Please open your Bibles to Hebrews 11. This is part of our ongoing series, Working Through Hebrews. We're now in the faith chapter. Verse 1 of this chapter told us that faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And the rest of the chapter focuses on examples from the Old Testament, uh, starting right from the beginning of creation, as we saw last time. Unfortunately for Adam and Eve, their big contribution to history is not a great example of faith, so the author of Hebrews skips them, and we go straight on to their children in today's verse, um, particularly one of their children. Hebrews 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel brought a God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. That's all that the author of Hebrews tells us about Abel. Let's talk about Cain and Abel. Now this story is found in Genesis 4, and I'm going to begin by reading the whole account, even though we'll be mostly focusing on the first section of it. So the story is found in Genesis 4, verses 1 to 16. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain bought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favour on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favour. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, <clears throat> where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, well, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you're driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put, funnily enough, a mark on Cain, so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. I'll end the story there. The main reason I've included the whole story here is to point out how gracious God is being to Cain through the whole thing. Yes, he doesn't look with favour on Cain's sacrifice, but he talks with Cain about how he could address this issue and do better. And even after Cain has been cursed because of murdering his brother, God still promises to look after Cain by giving him a mark of some description. Cain goes on to live a full life, he starts a city, he has children, and it, so this is not a case of God hating Cain. Cain does wrong and receives the consequences of his action, which is a curse, but God does not completely abandon him as a result. 
Neither does this curse go any further into Cain's family line. It is a personal curse, just as the mark that Cain receives is also a personal mark for him alone. I only highlight that because some cults have tried to make this verse into something that it's not, um, particularly as an excuse to justify racism. And there's no, no mention of anything like that in the text. But none of that is the main focus of our passage today. Rather, our verse focuses on a few aspects of the story with a special focus on the faith of Abel. Starting with the first part of our verse today, by faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. This section of our verse today focuses on the most well-known part of the Cain and Abel story. And yet it mentions an aspect that I feel is often misunderstood. A common way of reading the story is to say that Abel's offering was better than Cain's because Abel offered animals and Cain offered fruits of the soil. Mm. And it is true that other passages, such as Leviticus 17 verse 11, tell us that blood is required in order to atone for sin. For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. This, of course, is why Jesus had to die in order to see us forgiven of our sins. As Hebrews 9.22b puts it, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And as the song that Warren played for us this morning says as well, it's all about the blood, you know. The blood of Jesus is poured out. We thank him for the blood. That's what communion represents. All of that is true. Yet personally, I don't think that that interpretation is the best reading of this passage in history. In the story of Cain and Abel, there's no mention that these are supposed to be sacrifices of atonement. They are offerings rather than sacrifices per se. In fact, the Hebrew word used in that passage for offering isn't even the same one used to talk about atoning sacrifices. It's most commonly used to refer to grain offerings, which seems closer to what Cain offered than what Abel offered anyway. It also seems strange if God is going to reject Cain's offering just because it wasn't an animal, when at many other points in the Bible, non-animal offerings, again, not atoning sacrifices, non-animal offerings are accepted and even prescribed by God. As F.F. Bruce states it, Abel was a shepherd, Cain was an agricultural agriculturalist. In either case, the material of the offering was suitable to the offerer's vocation. It makes sense that someone who grows fruit is going to offer fruit. To me, it seems obvious that there must be something else going on in the Cain and Abel story. And in looking a bit closer, I think the answer is found in Genesis 4 verses 3 and 4, which say, In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions, from some of the firstborn of his flock. The biggest difference that I can see between the offerings of Cain and Abel, other than what they were, is found in the two phrases, in the course of time, and some of the firstborn of his flock. Every translation I could find includes something similar to the sentiments of these two phrases. Namely, Cain eventually decides to offer some of his produce to the Lord. The really old Whitcliffe ver version of the Bible, which is older than the King James, words it, Soothly it was done after many days that Cain offered gifts to the Lord of the fruits of the earth. I'm mentioning that mostly because I think soothly is a fun word. <laughs> but also, it stresses it was after many days. Cain had worked hard, he'd built up his resources, he had a lot of the fruits of the soil, and he was like, Mm, yeah, I guess I can give some of these to God. I have enough to spare. 
you know, biggie. Meanwhile, Abel gave some of the firstborn of his flock an idea that some translations give as the best parts of his best sheep, or even the first lamb born to one of his sheep. But all translations carry the implication that Abel gave an offering as soon as he had something to offer before he built up a stockpile of resources. He gave sacrificially. You could say he gave confident of what he hoped for and certain of what was still unseen, the fact that God would provide him more to replace what he gave. A similar story is told in Luke 21, 1-4. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow putting two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Jesus praises the woman for her generosity, and the implication in the Cain and Abel story is that God praises Abel's behavior in a similar manner. Genesis 4, 4 and 5, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. If we remember that God continues to be gracious to Cain for the rest of the story, we can eliminate the idea that God somehow just doesn't like Cain. The only difference mentioned to this point between the offerings is the sacrificial element of Abel's. If we're going by a strict reading of the passage, we can't even accuse Cain of just copying Abel or giving grudgingly, as some commentators suggest, because Cain's offering is the first one mentioned. And at no point in the story has God instructed either brother to offer anything at all. This is something they have both chosen to do on their own. Which is why God's response to Cain is so significant. Genesis 4, 6 and 7. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. What does this tell us? Now remember, this is early scripture. This is so far in the past that the law of Moses hasn't been written yet. There's no nation of Israel. God hasn't commanded that Cain or Abel give offerings to him. And yet, his response to the offerings suggests that giving to God and giving sacrificially, as Abel did, is the right thing to do. Now, Cain seems to have come up with the idea of even giving an offering, but he still hasn't gone about it in the right way. If Cain does what is right, he will be accepted. In doing so, he will rule over sin, but if he doesn't, sin might leap at him, which we see that it does in the story. This I find fascinating, because to me it suggests a few things. Firstly, it suggests there are some things that are right for us to do that God does not necessarily command us to do, and that nevertheless we are still held accountable for how we do them. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us, for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now this verse is not talking about salvation, because we know that salvation is wholly provided by the work of Christ. But it is talking about things that we choose to do or not do in this life. This verse is a New Testament verse, a post-resurrection of Jesus verse, a verse with full awareness that the law of Moses has been fulfilled by Christ. 
It's a verse written by Paul, the same author that tells us we no longer have to live up to the requirements of the law because of the work of Christ. And yet, it tells us that there are good things we should still choose to do in this life and bad things that we should avoid doing. And that if we do these good things and avoid these bad things, we will still be rewarded for it at the final judgment. And Abel seems to have figured out what one of those things are by only the second generation of human history. By faith, Abel was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. The second thing God's response to Cain suggests, and that our verse in Hebrews supports, is not only that we should give offerings to God, which is something that both Cain and Abel seem to have figured out, but that how we give offerings to God matters too. This seems to be what is meant when God tells Cain in, verse, uh, in Genesis 4 verse 6 that if he does what is right, he will be accepted. It also seems to be what results in God looking on Abel and his offering with favour, which in our verse, in our verse in Hebrews interprets as Abel being commended as righteous. Let's not gloss over righteous too quickly. Righteous is the Greek word dikaios, which is the Greek word for righteous. It usually refers to God's proper standards and actions expressed in the covenants. It's about being in right covenantal relationship with God. As a noun, which it is here, it refers to a person who is in accord with God's standards in proper relationship <coughs> with God. Abel, by his actions, is seen as righteous. He is in accord with God's standards in proper relationship with God, even though he is a sinful human born to sinful parents. He is nevertheless seen as doing right in God's eyes by his actions, all because he offered a better sacrifice than his brother did. But how is it better? We've already seen that Abel's sacrifice was one of the first one, the first fruits of his labor, whereas Cain gave from his plenty. But that also shows something about the heart of these brothers. Abel's offering shows trust in God. Cain's offering shows trust in his possessions. This is fairly self-explanatory, but it's still worth reminding ourselves, particularly being part of the Western capitalist culture that we are. Mm. The source of all of our provision is ultimately God. Not our jobs, not our own work ethic, not our bank accounts. God provides us with what we need. We even sang it this morning, you provide every need. That doesn't just mean that I'm walking down the road and going, oh, I feel a little bit thirsty. God, can you give me a drink? He's like, okay. It actually means that he's giving us everything all the time. He even gives us the ability to earn money. He gives us oxygen. He created it. Or everything comes from him. Matthew 6, 31 and 30 to 33. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. This doesn't mean we avoid work. On the contrary, the Bible also instructs us in Colossians 3, 23 and 24, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. We listen to his prompting. We do our part, we work to the best of our abilities in whatever job we have found, but even as we do that, we put him first, above all other considerations, above the bottom line of the company, above the goals of the company, even above our own financial well-being. The Colossians passage 
emphasizes that our true reward isn't the financial gain we get in our pay packet. It is the inheritance we receive from the Lord for working on his behalf. Abel puts God above all other considerations when he gives the first fruits of his flock. Cain puts his own interests first, and God gets the distant second once Cain feels he has enough to spare. The other thing that shows the difference between these brothers, when I dig into this passage a little, Abel sees himself as dependent on God. Cain sees God as dependent on him. What do I mean here? Cain's offering is all about Cain. Cain has possessions. Cain has financial stability. Cain has all the fruits of the soil to offer. Cain, in his incredible generosity, has decided to bless God by giving something to God. It's like God has been serving Cain, and Cain has decided to give him a tip, to give him a little bit of inheritance. Thanks, God. Thanks for your help. Here you go. Have some fruit. How misguided at best. How arrogant at worst. Psalm 50, verses 9 to 12. God says, I have no need of a bull from your stalls or of goats from your pen, for every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the field are mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you, for the world is mine and all that's in it. God doesn't desire us to give to him because he needs the money and he will be grateful to us for giving it to him. He desires us to give to him to make sure he has our hearts. Abel gives to God to show that he trusts God for what he receives. He is not trust, trusting in the natural. What if there are no more lambs after this first one? What if I give this lamb to God and now I go without because I'll never have another lamb? That doesn't seem to come into Abel's mind at all. He is dependent on God anyway. The lamb belonged to God anyway. Abel is simply acknowledging that by giving it, by giving it back to him. Abel is thankful to God and gives a sacrificial offering to show that thankfulness which is why he gives. Compare that with the story of the rich young ruler. I won't put it up, you all mostly probably know that. Um, he was someone like Cain who thought he was doing good, but <laughs> whom money had taken a hold of. It's some, the rich young ruler is someone that Jesus actually instructs to give away his wealth, and he's unable to do it. He would rather have his wealth than have Jesus. And that's tragic. Our trust needs to be anchored in Jesus, not in our material possessions. And yet that sort of trust is quite a struggle for us in the Western world, who are far better off than the majority of other people in the world, even if we consider ourselves rather poor by our own social standards. It means we are already much more like the rich young ruler or like Cain, people with much who can feel secure because of our own possessions. As I said when I was speaking on Hebrews 7, if you are well off and you give from what you have, you're not showing faith in your giving. To give something away that doesn't mean anything to you could be seen as generous but there's no heart in it, no trust. So am I saying that because we're all well off, we need to give all our money away in order to greatly trust in Jesus? Well, if God is telling you to do that, you better do that. Don't be like the rich young ruler. But no, I'm not saying that in general. Most people won't be called to do that. And God does desire that we steward our resources well too. What I am saying, though, is that God wants us to have a generous spirit, 
And we need to consider the ways in which we can foster that in our own lives. Jesus doesn't criticize the rich people at the temple for giving. He only points out that the poor widow has given more. One way to be generous could be looking for needs and sowing into them. Something that means only a little to you might mean the world to someone else. We as a church are now beginning to sow into the church in Indonesia, which is a country that has very little in the way of finance, and which even our smaller combined income can still make a huge difference in. And of course, as we seek to foster generous spirits and learn how to trust in God for our provision, we can also learn from the example of Abel, which is something that the final part of our verse today talks about. By faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. Now, as this is an expositional preach, I do want to acknowledge there are two ways of looking at this final sentence. I will talk about both of them. The first is a little bit abstract, but it digs a little bit more out of the original story, particularly the verse in Genesis when God, confronting Cain about Abel's murder, says that Abel's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now, that way of reading this passage says that the author of Hebrews um, appears to be saying that Abel is still asking God for vindication, waiting until he attains it in full in the judgment to come. He then goes on to parallel that with Revelation 6, 9 to 11, where the souls of martyrs cry aloud for vindication and are told they must wait until the full number of martyrs is complete. If you're reading the passage in that way, what it's doing is giving you the reminder that God will eventually make all things right. No murders will be left unpunished, even Abel's. No guilty party will get away with it. All the things that seem to be unfair about this life will be put right. Revelation 21, 4 and 5 tells us regarding the end of the age, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. God will wipe away every tear. Everything wrong will be put to right. And that is a very good thing to remember, which is why I mention it here as a possible interpretation, even though it's a little bit complicated. The far more straightforward way of reading Hebrews 11 verse 4 is to understand that Abel, because of his faith, can still speak to us as a role model of faith today, even though he's dead. In reading the verse this way, we also understand that what we can learn from Abel is how to give faithful offerings, as there's not really a lot else that we know about him. We can learn that giving our first fruits to God is showing a trust in God, no matter what else we already have. The term first fruits is a biblical one, and it's a good principle if you want to begin exploring the idea of fostering a generous spirit. Abel already had a flock. The first fruits was the first income from that flock. He gave his first income, a portion of it, the fat portions, to show that God was worthy of his trust, to show that he was not ruled by his possessions, to show that he was willing to be generous with whatever God gave him. And we can learn the same thing. This is one reason why we as a church believe in tithing. It is giving the first fruits of our income to God, showing our trust in him before we deal with any other financial obligations. And as a church, we actually tithe the first portion of what comes into the church as well. It can sometimes be a leap of faith to make giving to God your first task of each payday. But I, as I'm sure those of us in this room who do tithe can testify, it's amazing how far the rest of the money stretches when we honour God with our first fruits. Yes. God wants to have our hearts and our trust and our faith. And sometimes our possessions can get in the way of that. 
Abel shows us how to keep God central despite the blessing of provision. And in that way, through his act of faith, he continues to speak to us even though he is dead. Now today's passage, the whole thing we've looked at, talks a lot about generosity and giving, which can be a touchy subject, but it's also one that I think we all benefit from reflecting on from time to time. So as we wrap up today, I'm going to put up a few questions for us to think about. Perhaps you can chat with the people sitting around you about one or two of those before you head downstairs for morning tea. Or you can head downstairs for morning tea and chat about them down there. Or perhaps you can write them down and ponder them throughout the week. But they are worth reflecting on, particularly when our passage ends, like today's, by challenging us to consider how the passage is speaking to us. By faith, Abel speaks even though he is dead. That kind of means that we need to be thinking about how he's speaking. So here are my three questions that I put up, um, and they'll pop up in a moment. Maybe. There we go. Um, I've also thought of a fourth one, which I can add on there. But basically, how does Abel's faith speak to me? The passage says that it should. In what ways does Abel's faith speak to you? Second, what is something else that might be right to do even if God hasn't commanded me to do it? I think that's a fascinating thing to explore. And thirdly, how can I foster a spirit of generosity in my own life? And then for those of you who already are regular givers, when I challenged you about maybe there's something that you can say about how God has provided and shown himself faithful, the fourth question I'd say is, what's an example of that? Have you got something that you could share about how God has come through, about how God has added to what you already had or stretched it further? Yeah, that would just be a good encouragement to give to someone. So these are my questions for today. I do suggest maybe write them down, have a think about them, and let's uh, allow God's word to be that thing that stirs us to transformation, to be even more generous in the spirit, to reflect him even better. Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your faithfulness. And I thank you that your word does challenge us. There's always something more we can learn from it. Lord, I thank you for this passage. I thank you for the faith example of Abel, who was willing to trust you even when he didn't have anything to trust you with. And Lord, who also was able to trust you when he did have things to trust you with. Lord, I ask that today we would all reflect on what it means to be generous on what it means to live with a spirit of generosity, of what it means to give to you in a sacrificial way. And that, Lord, we would all make the adjustments in our lives to be able to do that in a more biblical way, in a way that brings more glory to you and allows you to be first in our lives. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your love.